For those of you who are amazing Dobbs fans, which I assume is just about everyone in this room, <laughs> many of them, uh, many awarded. Our guest has gotten uh, Agatha Awards, uh, among other things, including for the first novel, the first Maisie Dobbs. Um, and uh, these, her novels are constantly on the New York Times bestseller list and also as a national uh, bestseller. But tonight is a standalone. Tonight is a little different. Uh, for our guests. Uh, it takes place in 1914. There is a tie into, of course, this is the anniversary of the beginning of World War I, um, and there's a tie into the book uh, tonight because it's also about the beginning of the war, and it takes place on two fronts. One is literally the front lines, uh, and the other is a farm in England, um, and the two stories uh, that go back and forth between the two main characters uh, in this book. So uh, uh, a little different, but very intense. The usual, everything you expect from the Maisie Dobbs uh, novels is also in tonight's book. A couple of quick reviews. Uh, Herman Welk, who knows something about war, um, wrote The Winds of War and War and Remembrance, says in part, an engaging picture of the human spirit in a distant time of war, World War I, from the battlefields to the home front in an English village. Uh, Adam Hochschild, who wrote The Two End All Wars, A Story of Loyalty and Rebellion, 1914 to 1918, says of tonight's book, a haunting evocation, evocation from an unusual angle of the war that casts such a shadow over the whole 20th century. Jacqueline Winspear knows her native England and the human heart very well indeed. And from someone whose name you may recognize, especially if you're a regular here, because he is from Martin Cruz Smith, uh, who wrote, among other things, Gorky Park says, there is power in subtlety. This one is a stunner. Uh, so would you please welcome your friend and ours, Jacqueline Winspear. something and I'll get to tell you what I'm doing if you didn't already guess it. Oh. <laughs> I had to fish the tea bag out of the tea before it got too strong for me. <laughs> I just had to prepare everything. Thank you so much for coming and I, I understand that a lot of you had to struggle through some very, very um, difficult traffic to get here. Hasn't it been one of those days? Um, I was actually in Houston this morning and my plane was terribly delayed because of, um, a, there's only two runways at SFO at the moment, and they've got too many planes coming in for the two runways, so they're having to stop planes coming in from all over the world. And it's summer. I mean, <laughs> how great is that? Um, uh, one of the things that um, Elaine mentioned was the upcoming Mystery Writers Conference, which I have the great honor of being co-chair of that conference. and. Um, and I just want to underline what Elaine said, that it, if anyone's interested in, in writing the mystery, it really is a fantastic event. And uh, people have to work really hard as well, which doesn't put people off, amazingly. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to underline that. It's a terrific event. And this, uh, it always gives me such pleasure to be in this bookstore, not just because it's my, my home patch, but <coughs> because I'm such um, a lover and supporter of the independent bookstores. And I think one thing to underline that sometimes we miss is that it has so much to do with free speech. Um, that the, the independent bookstores go way beyond so many other, um, let's say, outlets about to bring you books that are, you know, maybe the, the one-off that you wouldn't find anywhere else. And because I'm a new American citizen, I might add, <laughs> you a little bit more about the care and management of lies and then I'm going to read a little bit from the book and then I'll answer some questions for you if uh, unless I've stunned you all into silence. Uh, the first thing to underline is this is not a part of the Maisie Dobbs series, it is a standalone and is not a mystery. And it has, a, I think, a, a different tone to it as befits this particular story. Um, the story is written from four different points of view, mainly to that of um, a young woman, Kezia, who has just been married to a farmer. His name is Tom. Her very best friend is actually Tom's um, sister, Thea. And they have been somewhat, um, uh, let's say, not such great friends of late because they seem to be taking different paths. Thea is one of those incredibly passionate people you sometimes meet in life that there's also a little bit at odds with herself. She's a suffragist and a pacifist at what becomes <coughs> an enormously difficult time to be both. And there is another gentleman 
who becomes um, Tom's officer when he goes to the front. And we also see the relationship between Tom and Kezia through his eyes. That's what I'm going to tell you about that bit now, because otherwise, you know, I might as well stand here and read the whole book. <laughs> so where do stories come from? Uh, uh, this always fascinates me when I meet other writers. Where do their stories come from? What's, what kindling was laid down to sort of spark the, in, in the entire story? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about when this story first came to me, which was actually around about the last ice age, when I was in my uh, mid-twenties. A uh, long time ago. <laughs> and... Um, I had my day job. I was working for an academic publisher. And if you know anything about publishing, you know that academic publishing has very little in common with general books. It's a bit like the difference between sort of being a, a baker and making software somewhere. It's sort of, uh, <laughs> very different. And I spent most of my time um, in universities and polytechnics in, um, in Britain and other places in Europe talking to professors. Um, getting them to use our books and also getting them to write new books, things like that. So, you know, very much in the halls of academia for most of my working life in, with that particular, when I was in that particular job. One of my friends who happened to work for the same company, um, she was a, uh, actually a creative director of the company, said to me one day, I'm thinking of starting a stall, thinking of getting a stall down Portobello Road. Do you want to help me with it? And I thought, this would be great. I mean, you know Portobello Road. You've seen Notting Hill. It's got such a great vibe. And I thought, well, this would be a great thing to do on weekends, maybe just on Sundays. So on Sundays, that's what I used to do. I used to go, we used to go down to the market, completely different life, I have to tell you. And uh, we dealt mainly in art, deco, china, pottery, jewelry, that sort of thing. But of course, when you've got that sort of business, you have to keep it fed with new stock um, on, on which you'd like to make some money, if you possibly can. So very often I would go along on a Saturday to, to jumble sales, what you call rummage sales here. You know, you go along to a town and there's a local church hall and everybody's basically getting rid of their, you know, they've donated their junk or something like that. And uh, my brother at the time, he had a day job, but he also had a stall in another part of London. So deep within us, there is probably the, you know, the, the soul of market traders. And uh, so we went along to a jumble sale and we parted because he was looking for something different. But of course, I had to wave any of the books. The old, moldy, covers falling off them, binding loose, and Fox Pages, all those books that I just love to nose through, usually sneezing because of the mold. <laughs> and I came across this book. I would have bought it here tonight to show you, but it literally weighs an awful lot. It is sort of yay thick. And it's called The Woman's Book. And literally the cover was falling off. Um, it was, but every page was there. And it was this amazing book, first published in 1911. It was a complete compendium for not just the new woman, but the traditional woman. And I used to really love collecting, and still do quite like collecting, old books on household management. But this was something different. It had all of that. But it also had sections on how to be a political activist. Remember, 1911. How to, um, how to be a freelance writer. Freelance writing was very big with women in the early part of the last century, and indeed just the end of the 1800s. There's a job you can do at home, and you don't, you know, you don't have to go out to work, and you know, it seems like such a genteel thing. So, very popular uh, line of work. Um, there was a section on how to run a farm, how to work in um, horticulture, um, how to work in education, and, and what it meant to work in education. But at the same time, you could read a section on, um, you know, running the household. From with things like how to black a stove. I don't know if you've ever seen that stove blacking they used to use. Um, my grandmother used to use it on the an old cast iron stove. I mean, I only have to smell that stuff and I'm sort of like three years old again. And so how to black a stove, but there's also a section on running a dinner party and where to seat the prime minister if the king is present. <laughs> now, I'm pretty sure that if you black your own stove, the king is not coming to your house for dinner. <laughs> book and I was leafing through it, totally lost in time, and then I did what I always do, I went straight to the, the um, fly leaf, or the front, uh, the, the, the front pages, because I love to look at old inscriptions. I love to see that beautiful um, sort of copper plate writing, the notion that this book was given to someone so many years ago and I have got it in my hot little hands. And then I just felt my heart ache 
because this book had been given to a young woman on the occasion of her marriage just one month before the outbreak of World War I. Mm -hmm. And I stood there thinking, what on earth happened to this couple? You know, what happened to them? Did he go to war? Well, you know, he probably did go to war. But did he come home again? Was she widowed? Did she go out to work? You know, was she one of those women that went to work in munitions? Did she, you know, one of the women that perhaps drove trains or buses, that worked in, um, you know, for example, in the Secret Service, that worked in the myriad of roles that over two million women in Britain went into in World War I? What happened to this couple? I wasn't a writer then. I had this dream of being a writer. Writers were people on pedestals, you know, I didn't dare to be one or assume I would ever be one. But I kept this story in my mind and it sort of just sat there over the years. And then it was when I had the great fortune to be uh, to have Maisie Dobbs published, and, and I still get, I can't get over it actually, <laughs> but um, that I, this story kept coming back to me and I knew I was going to have to write it. And then of course the day came and I thought, this, I have to do it now. And I was very lucky to have the support of my agent who's sitting here now, uh, Amy Rarett. And uh, <laughs> because the truth is that if you are a, a writer of a series, very often your publisher does not want you to do anything but the series. That's all they want is the next book in the series. And uh, I think everybody saw that I meant it, <laughs> that this is what I'm going to do next. And uh, that doesn't mean to say Maisie Dobbs is not coming back. She returns next uh, spring uh, with a new adventure. But I had to write The Care and Management of Lies. And what actually happened was that I, I started to pour more of, uh, not me as a person into it, but um, I rooted it in some of my history. Um, Kezia is the name of my great-great-grandmother. I gave the main character her name. I set the farm in my mind's eye in the place where I grew up, and the farm is a farm where I spent most of my childhood. I could see that farm as I was describing it. And, you know, I was going on recollections of people I knew when I was a kid, their recollections of the war. And I was trying to root it in, in things that were very personal to me because the book had become, that book, the woman's book, had become incredibly personal to me. So, um, so moving on, it was, uh, something that I wanted to do and I realized that I'd always wanted to do was to write a novel or, or, or bring a, a story to fruition that didn't just look at the battlefront but looked at the home front and looked at the place where those two meet because they do meet and um, very often I, I think there's a, we miss the minutiae of life that happens when a country is at war because life does go on even though it goes on with a very heavy heart in certain places. Um, and one of the things that I, I started to be very interested in, because remember, I've done a lot of research at the Imperial War Museum and places like that for my Maisie Dobbs books. I have sat in the archives of the Imperial War Museum reading over letters that um, young men had sent from the front to their families, their loved ones, and reading the letters that went back to them. Um, and these letters that are kept in the archive there, and there are thousands of, of them in the collection, um, they're not necessarily written, well, they're definitely not written by famous people whose names you might know, but all the, the, um, the archive consists of collections of letters and diaries from ordinary people. So for example, if, um, say about 20 years ago, um, you know, a great uncle died, or a great aunt, a grandmother or someone that um, uh, maybe when the family were clearing out their belongings they found a box of letters under the bed and realized they were written in a time of war. They would donate those to the <coughs> war museum because it becomes a crucial part of social history. It's part of our social history, if you will. And one of the things that I realized was so very important was the issue of food. And, you know, Napoleon got it right. An army marches on his stomach. <laughs> and in fact, um, it was Lawrence of Arabia who said, during, actually during the Great War, that the thing that changed the whole, if you will, um, tableau of war, more than anything else, was not the machine gun. It wasn't modern technology. It was the invention of bully beef. And I don't know if you know what bully beef is. You might as well be eating leather. It came in, little, it came in tins 
that were, um, you know, sealed, if you will, and it was slices of horrible beef that uh, tasted very much like old shoes chopped up in gravy. <laughs> and that enabled troops to move, um, to go further afield, to remain further afield at the front lines longer because they could give them bully beef so that they could cook up their own dinners. There are whole recipes, actually, in this little book here, which is a field manual that was given to a soldier in 1914. Whole recipes about what you can do with bully beef, and every single one of them is disgusting. <laughs> um, it didn't do anything with the digestive system, let me tell you. Um, but it was fascinating that, that you know, one of the things that soldiers craved was something from home. And this is where we move into the realm of an emotional nostalgia and exactly how much of that is attached to food. And I think we can all remember a time when we've been away from home and you've had a craving for something. I was telling some people the other day, I, I experienced that when I was about 21. And I know I'm digressing here, but I can remember this very vividly. I was a complete vegetarian when I was 21. And I was in Saudi Arabia for a period of time. And I had a craving for a bacon sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> and not only could you not get a bacon sandwich in, in Saudi Arabia, I probably wouldn't have liked it if I had it, but I had this craving for a bacon sandwich. And what I had a craving for was actually being at home. I wanted to be home. And this is why so many soldiers were sent sort of packages of food from home, sending cakes and biscuits and their favorite drinks and bovril, which is a kind of a meaty drink you can make up with a cue. And um, it was really interesting that the whole advertising in Britain changed as foodstuffs were advertised as being great for the troops. Ovaltine went from being a drink to help you sleep at night to being this is good for morale on the front, you know. <laughs> and uh, they also advertised it as being good for women who worked in the factories. So this whole food um, issue is really writ large and was very important to soldiers, as it is today. And so that's one of the themes that you'll encounter in the care and management of lives, and particularly comes up in this relationship between Tom and Kezia. And just to underline what I mean about the importance of food as a sort of a, an area of emotional nostalgia, think how many times coming up to Thanksgiving, coming up to the holidays, you see politicians and celebrities rush to Afghanistan, or they rush to Iraq, or they rush to wherever um, soldiers are overseas to be photographed dishing up the dinner. It's, it touches us, doesn't it? Our boys are okay because they've got their Thanksgiving dinner and look who's dishing up the dinner and everybody looks happy. While I was writing this book, I had a really, um, I just want to share with you this really kind of emotional experience. Um, my oldest, oldest friend um, in England, we've known each other since we were sort of um, oh, that was beyond the last art I say to my head. But a long, you know, we go back a long way. And her son, um, at the time, was on his third tour of duty in uh, Helmand province, Afghanistan. And I was telling her husband, by the way, is also a career army officer. And I was telling her about my new book and the book that I was, my work in progress. And her eyes just filled up. And she started to tell me about how it had been for her husband to send him his favorite foods when he was um, stationed in Bosnia. Mm -hmm. And then she said, you know, and you see what time Ian phones. Just see, and Ian's their son. And we sat down to dinner that evening, and they had the speaker phone sitting on the, on the, on the kitchen table, actually, as so we were sitting around having some kitchen dinner. And sure enough, boom, bang on dinner time, the phone rang, and it was uh, their son calling from Afghanistan on the satellite phone. First question out of his mouth is, what do you got for dinner, Mom? <laughs> <laughs> and he just wanted to, it was like he was there, part of the family. And I think that is something that uh, people miss when they're away from home, and particularly if they're away from home in a, a very difficult situation. It is that being with family around the dinner table and, and enjoying the comfort, the emotional comfort that being with those we love can give us. Um, just to give you, um, before I sort of move on um, to uh, a couple of other little, I suppose, factoids, um, just to tell you a little bit more about what food was like, uh, particularly in England. England, by the way, is now the foodie capital of the world. It's just unbelievable. I mean, the, the, the restaurants there are just amazing. But, um, you know, definitely at the beginning of the last century, there were a lot of um, 
Lots of thoughts and feelings about food. Definitely, if you were among the working classes, the, the poorer people, you had very, very poor nutrition. Bread was actually the staple of your diet. And very often, for the poorest of the poor, their dinner comprised a uh, you know, big pot of broth put on the table with anything else that they could think of to throw in there, and everybody dipped their bread in. Uh, they didn't even need utensils. That was, their, that was sort of breakfast, lunch, and dinner if they were lucky. Um, whereas from people at the other end of the scale had a completely different um, sort of way of eating and many, many courses and so on and so forth. So much so that there was actually a difference in height between the enlisted men and the officers because the officers came from the landed gentry, the aristocracy, um, and so on and so forth, the, the, the merchant classes who had a much better nutrition. Many young men uh, from the working classes joined up to get the king's shilling and purely to get meals inside them every day. But there was this other thing that went on, that whilst people from that were wealthier were perhaps used to going to restaurants, you know, uh, and so on, it wasn't quite as, you know, mostly people would eat at home, uh, they were, or they might go out to a dining room, let's say. But there was a great mistrust, particularly among the, uh, the, the working classes, the middle class wasn't such a big thing then, uh, but those that might be considered a middle class is a great mistrust about eating away from home because you never knew what was in your food if you ate away from home. And not only that, food <coughs> was something that was, was prepared by a woman. It had a woman's hand in it. It wasn't served and um, it wasn't prepared by men. And it was prepared by the woman at home. That was your mother, your wife, your sister or whoever. So a lot of men, can you imagine it, going to the front, suddenly seeing men dishing up their dinner. And not only that, men that really didn't know how to dish up dinner, that didn't look like dinner anyway. <laughs> you know, there was uh, one story of this, uh, where uh, a case of this, um, and in fact, I sort of, once I, I read about this, I thought, oh, I'm gonna weave this in somewhere. That, you know, a brand new bunch of recruits come in, and there's the, the line for the food, which as we know now, now know, does not look like food. And they were dish the men were dishing it up with their hands. The men that were behind the counter, they were dishing it up with their hands. And they were dirty hands. But as they went down the line, the hands were becoming cleaner and cleaner. And cleaner. <laughs> so you know where the dirt was going, don't you? Um, bread. The men complained about the bread because it was brown. There was a belief that brown bread was better for you. That, sorry, white bread was better for you because it was cleaner. Um, but in those days, when people joined the army to go to war in 1914, all the army worried about was calories in and calories out. They did not care a hoot about the food being edible, being recognisable. Um, all the things that are important today, if you go to Afghanistan, the troops there have you know, something akin to Pizza Hut, because they know that it's really important for morale to see and taste food that we recognize and that we love. So this whole issue of food was, was uh, it's, it's something you're gonna read about in the care and management of lives and it's, it's something that, believe me, I did a, a lot of uh, research on looking into that period and um, I think I probably put on a bit of weight as a result of it. <laughs> I was hungry. Um, the, the letters, I think, are, are, you know, when I look back at the letters, that's uh, one of the most poignant things that I, I came across in my research for this particular book and for the Maisie Dogs books, and how people express themselves in letters. And of course, nowadays, we have the instant message, we have emails, and so many other ways to communicate. Um, the Postal Service, by the way, it bears uh, saying this, in Britain at the time, was absolutely brilliant. Uh, within three days of war being declared, there was a huge postal sorting office on the other side of the channel, huge. And there were several p big postal sorting offices set up around London to be able to get uh, mail from home to the front in as little as two to three days. This is at a time when uh, the average British town was getting 12 deliveries a day because of the penny post. That all went out the window around about the First World War, and now it's one a day, I think. But. Um, by the time the war ended, that postal sorting office in northern France took up a four acre space and uh, was absolutely massive. So when you think about all oh, these letters going back and forth, it was pretty amazing. So I think I've said enough about that and I'm just going to, to read you a, a piece from the book. Um, and here we meet our newlyweds, uh, Tom and Kezia. And uh, Kezia 
uh, is known, and she's, she's not a very good housewife initially, um, she realizes that she did not have a history of farming. She is a, a, um, a minister's daughter. She, her life was in the vicarage where they had a cook, and she realized pretty quickly she did not actually know how to cook. So she sort of makes it all up as she goes along. And uh, we, we meet her and Tom as he's actually wondering what this is on his plate. <laughs> <laughs> so what's this? Tom brought a sliver of something clear, something he could not identify out of the onion. It looks like onion, but it isn't. I found a fennel bulb in the garden, so I chopped it and added it to the butter. It tastes like licorice. He held his fork out to, to Kezia. Taste. And though she had her own fennel, her own kidney-filled onion drenched in her butter of her own concoction, Kezia leaned forward to receive the offering, taking Tom's wrist to steady his hand. I quite like it, she said, dabbing the corners of her mouth with a clean table napkin. When she first put out the wedding present linens, Tom left his at the side of his plate, instead using his handkerchief pulled from a dust-filled pocket to wipe his mouth. It's different, Kezi. I'll give you that. It's different. <laughs> Do you like it? She asked. Tom smiled, picked up her hand and brought it to his lips, kissing her palm as he smiled. It is a smile of suggestion, a smile only for Kezia. I like it very much, though I think I'd like to taste a bit less of the pepper next time. <laughs> he took his hand from hers and pinched her cheek, and at that moment she felt two things. She felt a rush of love rise up from her centre, though at the same time a little more of her definition vanished into the fog, and she realised that they were becoming one instead of two. And though part of her was filled with pleasure at this newness, still another part felt bereft. I have some bad news, Tom. Kezia could not have said why she chose that moment to tell Tom about Jimmy Hart, though when she looked back she wondered if there could have been a better time or a worse time. Tom's cheeks seemed to draw in when Kezia told him the news, as the weight of knowing settled upon him that a childhood friend had been killed in a war that barely seemed real, in his cocoon sameness of morning, noon, and night on the farm. In the middle of a season that followed another season and came before yet another, a life had been stopped, a body would never grow infirm, a face never age. All of this came to Tom. He took a handkerchief from his pocket and wiped his mouth. I'll have to tell the men, he said. Not the lads, not the boys, not any term of light affection. He had to tell the men. Now they were men who would stand tall, who would take the news with straight backs, backs that would be set to the land again with pick and shovel, with their shoulders into the plough. Now they would work all the harder to absorb the loss of one of their own. I'm sorry, Tom. I, I didn't know when to tell you. It's not your fault, Kezi. You're not a bloody Hun, are you? And you're not a general or a kitchener or anyone who has anything to do with all this. And Jimmy left to go into the army nigh on two years ago before we went to war. He stood up, scraping his chair, the screech against earthenware tiles like a score underneath his words. Outside the back door, the collies had heard his boots move and scampered up from the dirt, ready to follow. I'm going to tell the men, he repeated. Tom kissed Kezia on the cheek and turned to leave. Don't give me that fennel again, love. That taste, it'll only remind me of losing Jimmy. <laughs> Kezia sat for a long time. It was probably not as long as she thought, but it was, it was enough lingering when there was washing to be brought in from the line, when there was ironing to be done, a fire to be banked again, and tea to be prepared and set before her spouse. She went to the washing line and gathered in the sun-bleached sheets, pulling them to her so that she might bury her face in the folds, drowning her senses in the fragrance of something scrubbed and blown through with a fresh, wild breeze. Thank you very much. to ask them, if you do, or if I stunned you to silence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've stunned you to silence, obvious. <laughs> well, I think um, an obvious question is, what was it like for you to make the departure away from mystery and into uh, 
this kind of story, and yeah. did you feel yourself uh, in any way in the territory of the two at, at the time you were writing? Uh, the question was, uh, you know, basically about the experience of writing uh, this novel uh, after writing um, the, you know, the, the Maisie Dobbs stories, which are uh, mysteries, essentially. Um, how do I feel about that? You, you know, there was no confusion between the two. I knew what I was writing. But having said that, you know, when I started, I thought, oh, what have I done? Because, you know, there I was with this thing in my hand and my heart that I wanted so much to write, and suddenly someone had said, oh, sure, go, you can do that. And it was, <laughs> okay, I have to do it now. But it was, um, I really, really enjoyed it. That is not to say it wasn't a challenge, and I think I enjoyed the challenge. As a writer, I believe I needed that challenge at that point to do something different. And it, you know, it's, when you're writing about that kind of subject, you have to give everything to it. Otherwise, you, you, you shouldn't be writing about such a subject. Um, everything you can to it. Um, and I will say that when I got to the end, there was nothing more I wanted to say, but I was very sorry to see the character, to have to move away from the characters. I, I had to I, I needed to hold them with me and, and I still hold them with me. You know, I mean it's it's it, it was a very it's a very interesting process. Very interesting process. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking that. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. You said Cassia was your great grandmother's your great great grandmother's name. Cassia, yes. Yeah, Cassia. Did she have similar background? Was she a minister's daughter or did she No was she, she wasn't a minister's daughter? No. I am not sure what she was. Actually. Okay. Um I think that's when there's a little bit of a skeleton um, cupboard, actually. Um, but she uh, she was much younger than my great grandfather. I know that. And uh, but that's that's all I know. I about. just wondered she if there's some kind of correlation. No, there wasn't. There's no. There was the name. I just love the name. And, and in fact, I didn't know her name until a few years ago. And I think it was when I found the name that was when I thought, this is it. I I I'm I'm on my way now. Um, uh, and it was, just as an aside, by accident, one of my cousins uh, had a, a heart attack and was told he couldn't work for three months. And our family has never been big on going back and looking at your history. I mean, he, he got really bored sitting at home, so he decided, that's it, I'm going on Ancestry.com, and the next thing you know, we're all getting these emails about, did you know this, and did you know and on links, and it was like, oh, Jim, you know, another one? But then, Kezia, this, and I said, oh, my gosh, there she is. <coughs> There's my Kezia. So, um, but uh, yeah, it's, it, but no, not uh, not actually just the name. I just took the name. Mm, yes. Beautiful name. Uh, there's a question back there. As you were immersed in 1914 and that war, how much of what's going on with the wars of today was in your mind? That's a very good question. And the question is, as I was immersed in the 1914-18 uh, the war, what, you know, how much of the war is going on today was in my mind. Um, one of the big questions I had to ask myself was, you know, how, how, what is it like being at war? And, and certainly, you know, I have done a lot of reading and immersing myself in that era for years. But I found myself reading outside that era to get a sense, and also looking at some family stories as well. You know, one one of my uncles, he died a few years ago, but he was uh, one of the first people to um, to land on D-Day. It changed his life completely. And my mother said he was never, ever, ever the same since. But um, for example, there's Karl Malanti's book, What It's Like to Go, What It's Like to Go to War, which is uh, basically his memoir of his experiences um, during the Vietnam War. And uh, there's another book uh, that was written uh, post World War One, which was just about banned in its day, and had to be heavily censored because it was so um, yeah, a lot of language in it that uh, was considered very bad, and it would be considered very bad at any time. But you know, one of the things we have to realise is that people under pressure in that situation, you know, they're not using flowery language. Um, and so, you know, what does it feel like to be under that pressure? What does it feel like to be plucked out of your uh, milieu, your, your sense of safety, and suddenly there you are, 17, 18, or as many of the men in the Great War, well, they were boys, they, were lied, they lied about their age, they were 13, 14. I think one of the youngest um, 
the, one, of the, um, one of the graves that I saw in the Somme had the youngest uh, soldier killed and he was 12 years old. He had lied about his age and, and being accepted. Um, um, but you know, how does that feel to, to face what those men were facing? And indeed, um, and just to, to digress slightly, one of the things that really fascinated me, and uh, what I really wanted to, to look at, you know, looking at the woman's book, it was written at a time when life was very structured, very structured indeed. And you read these manuals, these army manuals, it's very structured. This is what you do here, this is what you do there. And yet, these people went into a war that they could not have predicted. Um, because an army, generally what they do, the people, the higher ups, they look at the most recent war to try and predict what will happen in the next war. And the most recent war for Britain was a war in South Africa, which was cavalry charges across the belt. They might have done a lot better to look at the American Civil War, which was trench warfare, machine guns, and so on and so forth. And so, what did it feel like to go from a, 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 a if you were a society where everybody knew their place and there was a place for everybody, where life was structured to a certain extent, uh, depending on your station in life, and then you go into chaos, where it was a surprise, if you will, for so many, not least you know the people who plan war. Um, so the, the answer to the question is yes, I did look at wars beyond um, our more recent wars, uh, absolutely, and, and spoke to um, you know people like my friend's son. And what does that? What does it feel like? And uh, you wouldn't want to feel like that, <laughs> you know. But thank you. It's a very good question. Thank you. Yes. When you were doing research, uh, do you do a lot of research before you start to write? Do you complete mm -hmm. what you think your research is before you start to write? That's a good question. It's about research. How do I do my research? Do I do it before I write? Is it complete and so on? You know, generally speaking, I would say from from what I've been writing, not only through my series, but so particularly with this book, I already have a grounding because of my interest and uh, curiosity about that period, which actually goes back to childhood. So there is a real grounding there. And what I have done typically before, um, uh, and, and in, like, during the process of writing each book, is I, I ask myself, what don't I know? What don't I know about? And I knew I needed to find out more about how, for example, food got to troops at the front in 1914, 1918 war. It's quite brilliant, actually. They even had bakeries um, behind the front lines. They had printing presses behind the front lines. It was just amazing when you look into it. But I literally have a, a sheet on the wall, and I put on it, what do I need to know that I don't know? And then I go about finding out about it. And, and what does that mean? It means using archives. It means you know calling up uh, librarians and, and specialist um, libraries and collections and so on, and really delving back into, into other people's stories. Um, you know, people often ask, ask me, do you do your, your um, research on the internet? I think the internet is a great index. <laughs> It'll lead you to other places, but I like to go to the source. You know, I find books like this, and I go through them. What does this feel like? Um, you know, what does this look like? And actually, one of the most fascinating things I found in here was how they tied up horses which was fascinating to me, because I have horses. But, um, uh, but uh, so it's, it's, it's a mixture of both. I, I go back to what I know, and go back to what I can already see in my mind's eye, but then I'm finding out more. And, and with each book there's, that I've written, there's been something that I, I've had to really delve into. That's a good question, thank, thank you. you. Yes, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's called sort of coupling, and, and you, you put the nose to tail, and uh, the reins of one horse over the saddle of the, the other. I'd like to try that with my two. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, what's the process of choosing your titles, which are always mm -hmm. very interesting? Well, thank you very much. Um, I really. I do, I've always got a title before I start to work. And sometimes that title is uh, inspired by a, a quotation that I found, uh, for example, with Leaving Everything Most Loved. And the title has to really resonate with me. It has to really resonate with me because the title underpins the whole story. And if I take the care and management of lies, 
If you look at a lot of those old books on household management, they start off with the care and the management of, the care and management of the modern home. The care, you know, the, 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 the management of uh, the home for the new bride, all those sort of things. And this, the care and management of lies, just seemed to cover all the bases for me. And, um, and I, I've actually only ever, ever had one title really questioned. Um, but you helped her. I hope so. I don't know any other writer who's had all 11 titles today. Yeah. Yeah. The same. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can be pretty stubborn about it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to change it. <laughs> and sometimes they've batted other titles at me, and then everybody says, you know, that really is the best title you can come up with. <laughs> but titles are so important. And, um, uh, and, and to me, I, I think because it, it it underpins my writing in a way. I hold it very tightly. It's not just words on a cover. It really means something to me. And I think titles are so important because they hold the promise of what is inside the book for the reader. And you know, you, I think it's, it's sometimes disappointing when you, you get a book that you, you buy based on a title, for example, and then you get in, it's not quite what you expected. Yeah. Um, so uh, to me, it's, there is such a close connection. It's very important. But thank you for asking that question. Yes. I don't have a question. I just have a comment. I wanted to say thank you for writing your previous series, and this one I haven't read, but for stimulating my thinking about the First World War. Because oh, I found that when I was reading your novels that I, it would stimulate my thinking. I'd go running to the internet index yeah. and start looking things up and really found out a great deal about World War One just because of the comments and how you had written about certain battles and things going on with people and it sounds like this book will be much the same for me. So well, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. much indeed. Thank you. I, I, I think it's, um, you know, I'm a great, I'm a bit of a history buff anyway, but you know, that was a war that I think, you know, it, it's, it's very much, you know, present if you go across the Atlantic, but hasn't been treated in the same way, certainly not in schools as, say, the Second World War in this country. And yet, so much of what we're dealing with in the world today has its roots in the Great War. And, uh, you know, I think to, to um, and especially for kids, to understand the present, I think we have to look, go back. It's like, it would be like a plant not knowing its roots. You know, I think we have to understand that. So thank you, thank you very much. And I think story, not, you know, not just my books, but other people's stories, you know, we learn so much through story. And to me, what story touches, it's just like you know, myths and legends of old. It's what happens to the people. You know, because when I was a kid, I would sometimes get a bit frustrated till we ended up having a great history teacher. But about history lessons, because it was sort of like journals and dates, and you know, the, the this and that, and here's the date. And, um, but, what happened to the people? And uh, that's who I wanted to know about. And also the fact that, <clears throat> you know, for example, a war is given a finite set of dates, 1914 to 1918. <clears throat> or the Second World War, 19, depending on where you are, 1939 to 1945, or 1941 to 1946, or 45, or whatever. But it does, as Lady Rowan says in my second novel, Birds of a Feather, that's the trouble with war. It, uh, you know, it's, it lives on inside the world. It's never over when it's over, it lives on inside the living. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's a little factoid that um, after the, you know, during the First World War, there were many soldiers that were institutionalized with shell shock, who were profoundly shell shocked. Um, the last one of those who died in, uh, in the institution that he remained in for the rest of his life actually died in 1994. And when he first went into that same institution, it was known as an asylum. By the time he left, it was a, a psychiatric care center, which just shows you the passage of time by the very title, which had changed about five times in his lifetime. So thank you for that question.